If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 8. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Paul says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you now that as we, we set aside these next few moments and unpack your, your word, your, this passage, I pray that you would help us to be able to focus. I pray that you would take away the distractions of, of life in general and help us to be able to look at your word, see what it says, uh, glean from it the, the truths you have for us. I pray for those who know you as Savior. I pray that you would help us to grow in our faith and grow in our, in our sanctification, our, our Christ-likeness. And I pray for those who don't know you as Savior yet, that they would see a passage like this as we march through it and see their need to put their faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would, your name would be glorified. I pray that you would encourage us and challenge us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So after a couple weeks away, we're getting back into our study of 1 Thessalonians. Just some, I can't remember what went on the last couple weeks that uh, we didn't get into Thessalonians, some holiday or something, right? No, we, we talked about the triumphal entry of Christ, Palm Sunday, and then last week we talked about the resurrection of Christ, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, so the, the, the honestly, the most important Sunday of the Christian calendar. We love Christmas. We love, you know, that's a great time of year. And because it comes at the end of December, all of December is, you know, Christmas month. Easter doesn't quite get the same time period in our culture, you know, the, the, the same respect. But for, for Christ followers, Easter is the reason that we, you know, at, the resurrection is the reason. So we, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday last week. Now we're jumping back into our first Thessalonians study. Paul had, has described several characteristics of gospel ministry. He talked about the core of gospel ministry. Those are the last three messages in 1 Thessalonians. Now, as we, we're kind of turning a page in this book, chapters 1 through 3 were probably more theological. Chapters 4 and 5 are practical application. How do you, this is what ministry looks like. This is how you live godly, how you put that into play. So chapters 4 and 5 of this letter, Paul is going to turn to the topic of godly living. How do we behave as believers? We're going to be exhorted or, or, or taught, challenged to strive for spiritual excellence in our daily lives. That is the challenge for every believer. This chapter deals with sexual morality, brotherly love, and a godly work ethic. For sake of time, so we're not here until 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we're just going to focus on those first eight verses. We're going to talk today about sexual morality. Now, we need to remember that Thessalonica, this city, was firmly embedded in the pagan Roman culture. I mean, this was a Roman city. It was, uh, you know, it, it was in the culture. It certainly was not the most perverse city in the empire. You know, look, we're looking at you, Corinth. Corinth was known for being wicked. Rome itself was known for being very wicked. But the culture itself, the entire culture of the empire was pagan. The people in Thessalonica worshipped all the Roman gods and goddesses, including the gods and goddesses of love and fertility. So there was a lot of perversity, a lot of wickedness going around. Within that culture, marital faithfulness, purity, they weren't even considered virtues to most Romans. Like, we like to think that most people share the same general morality. Everybody knows it's important to be faithful to your spouse. Everybody sort of knows that, right? Not the Romans. 
Faithfulness within a marriage was not an, a virtue in their culture. Humility, self-sacrifice, those weren't Roman virtues. So it's very different culture, at least has been. I think we could probably recognize our own culture is becoming Romanized. Our, our culture is becoming this. You will see people within our culture that really fight against the idea of monogamous marriage. Paul has led most of these people that he's talking to to Christ, this church in Thessalonica. Paul probably led almost all of them to Christ. And now he's teaching them how to live in a way that will set them apart as Christ followers. And he said, that's a challenge for us because the Christ follower cannot continue to live like a pagan. Uh, that was true of the first century. It's true today. If you are going to claim to be a Christ follower, you cannot continue to live like like a pagan. Now, if you want to go find a church out there, and there's a ton of them that tell you, you can live like the devil, but just claim Christ. They're, they're out there. But Paul doesn't allow for this. Christ doesn't allow for this. And so Paul's going to teach this church from a distance how to live as Christ followers. So as we unpack the first half of this chapter, we're going to see three behaviors that characterize godly living, and, that's, and, and centered mostly on this idea of morality. So as we jump in, godly living is characterized, the first point, our first idea here, is it's characterized in pleasing the Lord, seeking to please the Lord. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you, as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. First thing I want you to grasp, and we need to just, you know, take this, take a moment here. Christians are able to please God. That's a big deal. That's a, that's an important concept. You ought to walk to please the Lord just as you're doing, Paul says. That is a revolutionary concept. Now, maybe you've been around the church for a length of time. Maybe you grew up in church, and so you're used to this idea of, of talking about pleasing the Lord. and Yeah, obviously. But that's a revolutionary concept. The Christ follower has the ability to please God. And this isn't because we're better or smarter than the non-Christian. We are not. Sometimes if, you're, if you've been around church for long enough, sometimes you start to think that. You start to think that, you know, I'm better than the lost person. I'm better than my neighbor. And maybe you are better than your neighbor. Maybe you're not. But that's not why we can please God. That's not why Christ followers are capable of pleasing God. It is completely because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. That's why the Christ follower is even capable of pleasing God. We think of the God that's described in Scripture, unspeakably holy, set apart, all-powerful, all-knowing, pure, clean, uh, unapproachable glory. How can I please him? I know what I am. You know, when Paul talks about himself as the chief of sinners, right? Paul, Paul says he's the worst sinner he knows. And sometimes we read those passages and like, well, Paul, I, I know worse sinners than you. Like, well, Paul's not saying that he's the worst sinner. He, say, he says, I'm the worst sinner I know. But you know who the worst sinner I know is? Me. I'm the worst sinner I know. Hopefully you recognize that you are the worst sinner you know. Now I'm stepping on toes here. But that's important for us to grasp. I know what I am. How can I please a holy God? Well, because Jesus gave me the ability. He paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might live, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. You have your sin wounds. You have your sin uh, disease and unhealthiness. And yet, because of his wounds, you've been able to be healed. The sin debt has been paid. Forgiveness has been given. Peace with God has been granted. The believer is now free to glorify his or her creator. That is vital, and we, we can't move 
farther into the passage without recognizing that. That through God's grace, you can please God if you put your faith in Christ. The lost can't please God. They're still at war with God. That's what our sin is. That's what our rebellion is. When we think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, sometimes we describe it as they eat a piece of fruit. They pick the piece of fruit. What's the big deal about eating a piece of fruit? You know, I don't like fruit that much. No, I do actually. But, you know, Adam and Eve, they ate a piece of fruit. So what? Well, they didn't just eat the piece of fruit. God told them not to eat the piece of fruit. So in eating it, they shook their fist at God. We'll do what we want. We will be God. That was the lie that the serpent shares with Eve. If you eat the piece of fruit, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. It's a half-truth. Guard yourself because wickedness is full of half-truths. They already knew good. that The thing they didn't know was evil. But they're at war. The, the, the lost person, the sinner, is at war with God. They're still shaking their fist at God. The only path to peace is repentance. And trust in Jesus for salvation. God offers that hope of salvation. We declare war. God declares peace. And because God has saved, because he's rescued us from our sin, he deserves our love. You might ask that question, well, why do we want to please God? What does it matter pleasing God? Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3. He said, but whatever... Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. You could even, you could even uh, translate that word as dung in order that I may gain Christ. Because Christ paid our sin debt, because he rescued us from a lost eternity, he deserves our love. He deserves our desire to please him. Once forgiven, once adopted into God's family, the believer can grow in his or her faith. So that first step, that first idea here that we're capable of pleasing God. And as we've been brought into the faith, we can grow in our faith. And Christians must grow in their faith. This is what Paul's talking about. This idea of growing in the faith. He says, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. And this, the, this phrase, more and more, in the Greek, Paul's speaking of abounding. He's talking about overflowing in spiritual growth. This is that time of year when the, uh, the, your yard gets ahead of you. I mowed my grass yesterday. Uh, that's part of why I'm sunburned, because I was out, because I, I thought it'd be a good idea to get some sun. Well, I'm, I'm pasty, and I, I turn red, then I go pasty again. Then I turn red and go pasty again. But, but if I didn't mow yesterday, especially with the rain today, by the time I got around to mowing, it was going to be like three feet tall. This is that time of year where, where everything starts growing. It abounds. I look forward to mid-August, you know, when it gets dry, and uh, you don't have to mow the grass. The grass crunches when you walk on it, but you don't got to mow it, except for those three or four weeds that somehow they know where the water's at. I don't don't get that. But this is the picture that Paul is painting of, of, of overflowing, abounding in growth. That's what we're called to do. Paul says, I ask and I urge you to do this. And these these words are interesting because these are not commands. These are not uh, uh, iron-fisted orders. The word ask in Greek, the word that's translated, is a humble suggestion. It's a a gracious, he's, he's coming alongside these people and saying, hey, this is what you really need to do. I really need you to do this. The word urge uh, means to come alongside of. I urge, like, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come next to you and I'm going to help you along in this process. The idea Paul is getting is he's saying, please do this and we're going to help you along in accomplishing it. That's important for us to get because Paul's not talking about a solo adventure. You guys need to get going. He's, he's saying, we'll help you. We're, we need to go this direction, and I'm going to help you along. Nowhere in the scripture is the Christian life a solo event. 
The Christian life is a team effort. It always is. There's an individual relationship with God, certainly. But there's a reason why God creates the church. There's a reason why the, the letters, the, the epistles, Paul's epistles, but all the general epistles, they are written to churches. The couple that aren't. So there's Titus and Timothy who aren't written to churches. Who are they written to? Pastors of churches. How to minister in their church. The, the Christian life is meant to be lived together. God's people are to push each other toward godliness. We're to build each other up in the gospel. Hebrews chapter 10 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another. I think the King James says provoke. I love that word. You know, that idea, we think of people provoking. I got four kids. So provoking is just par for the course in our house. You know, don't poke the bear. That's what, that's what we say. Um, this idea of provoking one another we think of as, you know, to make people angry. And what, what the writer of Hebrews says is we should provoke one another, push one another toward love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this is, this is the picture of the Christian life. Paul is saying, you need to do this and we're going to help you along because we're in this together. Peter gives some direction on growing in our faith. He says this, uh, Peter's second letter. So 2 Peter chapter 1, he says this, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So God's given you everything you need. As you sit here as a, you know, if you're a believer, you put your faith in Christ and you sit here, you can know, you can be confident that God's given you everything you need in his word for life and godliness. By which he has granted to us his precious and great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. Then he goes on, verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Not work for your salvation, but you have faith. You, you put your faith in Christ. You, you're, 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 you've been adopted into the family of God, but yet there's more things to learn. There's, there's, there's growth that needs to happen. So he says, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he gives this list, and not so much, we're not going to spend any time really going through the list, we've done that in the past, but the two, two takeaways from this second Peter verse, one, God's given us everything we need. You don't need something else. You don't need to go down to, I don't know if the Christian bookstores are still open or not. I don't know if there are anymore. But you don't need to go down to that bookstore and find the super secret method of serving God, the, uh, the, the seven secret ways of having your best life now or something. You don't need that. You need God's word. He's given you everything you need. And the idea that Peter gives is that Christians are to keep learning about God, learning about his character and his expectations, and then we're to apply what we've learned to our daily lives. That's why he says, supplement your faith. He says, with knowledge, learn, keep learning. And then add, that, add to that self-control and steadfastness and godliness. That's the application. As I learn more and about, more about God, more of what he expects, I need to start applying that to my life. That's what we're called to do. So Christ followers, Christians must grow in their faith. That's part of how we please God, getting to know him better and better. You think of your own children. You know, most of you have children. If you don't have children, if, you're young, if you are children, one day you'll probably you know, grow up and get married and have children of your own. It is a joy to see your children learning things. One of my projects in the last year or so was uh, I bought a car with a manual transmission. Those are kind of hard to find these days, but I found one with the anticipation that I was going to teach my daughters and my wife how to drive a stick shift. I think that's just a wonderful thing to know. I, I love the idea that most of the boys don't know how to drive a stick shift. 
And so my daughters being able to do something that the boys can't, I kind of like that idea. That might be selfish and prideful, I don't know, but that's, that's my thought process. But over the course of the last few months, you know, we got into that car for the first time. And it, it's funny, if you ever get in a car you, with someone who doesn't know what they're doing and they see the three pedals, they're like, why, why is there three pedals? I have two feet. What's that supposed to do? But over the course of a couple months, they learn how to drive and, they, and they're able to, you know, this car doesn't stall as much and, the, you know, it doesn't lurch and, you know, they, they've, learned, they've gotten to the point where they can drive the thing. It's an incredible thing to see their knowledge and ability grow. And as a father, I love it. I'm excited about it. Sometimes we take the Volkswagen just because I want to, I want to watch them drive it. And I think we need to understand that, that God is very similar. Our Heavenly Father is very similar. He wants us to grow in our knowledge. As, as we grow in our faith, as we learn more and about him and our, and our Christ-like attitude develops, your Heavenly Father is pleased. Your Heavenly Father loves that. Christ followers are able to please God. And we're called to, part of that is called to grow in our faith. And as we move down into our passage, one of the, another way of working toward pleasing God is in avoiding immorality. Uh, verses 3 through 6. First of all, Paul says, this is, this is the will of God, your sanctification. First thing we see here is that God desires your holiness. This is something God wants. And again, as we just got done talking about, you know, this, our Heavenly Father, He's a personal being. God is a person, capital P, person, not a sinful human being. That's not what we're saying, but God is a personal being. He's not an impersonal force. Sometimes, and, and most of us probably wouldn't even verbalize this, but I think sometimes we think of God as the Star Wars force. You know, God is a force. He's an a, a, a impersonal, and, and there are some religions that teach that. But that's not what the Bible says. God is a person. There are things that God wants. Let that sink in just for a second. Now, the Bible is clear that God doesn't need anything from us. We don't need, God doesn't need us to feed him. Some religions teach that the sacrifices feed their gods. And if you don't sacrifice, the gods will starve. There are some false religions that teach that. God is very clear. He doesn't need anything from us. God is the source of life. He's the source of hope and love. He doesn't need us. But there are things that God wants, and this is one of them. God wants us to live holy lives. He wants our sanctification. Sanctification means holiness or purity. So when we say something is... Uh, uh, Sanctified didn't always, wasn't always a church word. Sometimes you think of uh, words that we, we hear in church, you don't hear anywhere else. Justifications, you don't hear that very often outside of church. Uh, propitiation, that's a word. You'll never hear that anywhere other than in church. Um, sanctification or sanctified wasn't always a church word. Sanctified literally means to be set apart for a purpose. So you could, if you, if you had your daily budget or your, your monthly budget and you set aside a certain amount of money for your car payment or for food, you could, you could call that it was sanctified for that, was set apart for that purpose. Now, in our, in our general culture today, it's basically become a church word. And the idea means that God has set his people apart to be holy or to grow in holiness. Grow in purity. We generally describe sanctification as a progressive growth. Uh, when you put your faith in Jesus, you don't, you don't become all-knowing, you know, all-knowing theologian. You have to learn. You have to grow just like a baby. There's a reason why, you know, the scripture writers talk about, you know, babes in Christ and desiring the pure milk of, of the word because we're very much like children in our faith and we have to grow and develop. It's a progressive thing. But this is what God wants from you. This is what God wants for you. And make sure you grasp that. God doesn't, doesn't necessarily want things from you. He wants things for you. Sanctification, godliness is good for us. God doesn't want to take any good thing away from you. 
sometimes we, I've, I've spent years as a youth pastor and trying to explain to teenagers that God doesn't want to take fun away from you. God doesn't, doesn't want you not to have fun. The problem is our sinful lives, our sinful hearts, our sinful eyes, we see things that are damaging. We see things that will, will brutalize us. We see that as fun. It's not good for you. God doesn't say no to good things. When God says no to something, it's because that thing is not good. But God wants for you to be sanctified, to be holy. The last verse of our last chapter in Thessalonians, so chapter 3, 13, says, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. God's desire is that you are established your hearts are blameless in holiness. That when God comes, the holy, righteous judge comes, he can look at us and we are without blame. I don't know, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but if you've ever stood before a judge, I've had a couple automotive encounters, and uh, I've, I've, I've been in court at a time, and there's, there's nothing fun about standing in front of a judge. But if you stand in front of the judge knowing that you're, you're not guilty, knowing how it's going how how to turn out. That's a different animal altogether. And he wants us to be able to be ready to stand before him blameless. That's what God wants for us. Today, many professing Christians claim that God doesn't have any expectations for us. You'll see massive ministries who teach that God has no expectations for you. God just wants to be your genie butler. God just wants you, just say the right words, pray his words back to him. If you say the right prayer, you can make God give you the raise that you want. You can, you can make God give you the health that you want. You know, those guys, there's guys that sell millions of dollars of books every year. How you can make God give you the things you want. And many of them claim that God doesn't have any expectations for you. God doesn't, God doesn't require that you live holy. He just wants to serve you. It's about you. What a sad day when a professing Christ follower won't follow Christ's commands. Hey, when you hear a church, when you hear a religious leader say that you don't have to obey God's commands, you need to recognize that as a false teacher. That's not a man. In the Old Testament, there was a warning about false prophets. Woe to them who say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord, when the Lord hath not said. I think that's King James paraphrase. But that's, that was a dangerous place to be in, to be a false prophet. In our society, we are surrounded by a lot of false prophets. God wants you to live holy. He wants you to avoid immorality. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 1 John 2, 4, whatever, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So God desires your holiness. He does not desire you to continue to dwell in the sin that he saved you out of. But, as we recognize God desires you to live holy lives, but holy living takes work. It takes effort. And we've talked about this several times in the last couple months. You do not work for your salvation. You do not earn your salvation. But as I've put my faith in Christ and I've been miraculously saved, God has work for me to do. And just like anything, if I want to become proficient in anything, I have to put in the effort. And holy living takes effort. It takes work. He says, uh, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his, bo his body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and we solemnly warned you. 
So he says, abstain from sexual immorality. The word translated sexual immorality in the Greek is porneus. That's where we get the, that's where we get the word pornography from. That's not the extent of what the word means, but that's kind of where, you know, how, how the Greek roots filter into uh, English. And it means any illicit or, or sinful sexual behavior, whether physical or mental. That's what it means. It, it's, it's a broad term. God sets this bar very high. God doesn't just say, yeah, I just don't want you to do that one or two things. He's talking about anything outside of his created order. Now, what is God's created order, right? Well, for, for a sexual ethic, it's one man, one woman within one faithful marriage. That's what God calls us to. Jesus says in Matthew 5, says, you've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus, Jesus sets this bar very high. This, this immorality includes anything outside of God's very specific created order. He says, abstain from it. So anything outside of God's righteous created order, one man, one woman, within one faithful marriage. And I have to say that. You have to say it that way. Um, sometimes you'll hear politicians, usually politicians on the right, will talk about traditional marriage. They're for traditional. I remember maybe 15 years ago now, some, some nationally known politician was talking about the, how he's for traditional marriage. And once you hear politicians, especially on the right, talking about traditional marriage, you know you're lost. You know, the, the laws are going to change. Because... Tradition, and you, maybe you've heard me say this before, in my estimation, tradition is what you call a thing when you don't remember why you do that thing, okay? That's it. So there are, we all have family traditions, things that we do over and over and over again, but a lot of us can't really explain why we do it. Why do we put a Christmas tree in the house? Maybe some of you don't, I, either way, but if you do, why do you do that? You might not know. We always have. I don't know why I do that. I don't know why we decorate it. Maybe we decorate it because it's pretty and we like it, but whoever thought of putting a tree you know, inside the house? Why do we you know, do these other different things? If you, if you don't know why you're doing a thing, usually you just define it as a tradition. That's why we do it. When politicians start calling marriage traditional, that means they don't know why it's why does it exist? What's the point? So we'll talk about biblical marriage because why do we believe one man, one woman in one faithful marriage? Because that's what God created. You go back to Genesis chapter 2. You see it repeated through scripture. One man, one woman, one faithful marriage. Paul talks about it being a picture of Christ and the church. That's God's expectation. Anything outside of that is immorality, is wrong, is damaging. And so what, Peter, what Paul says here is that you need to abstain from it. And abstain means complete separation. Now, remember, who's Paul talking to? He's talking to these Thessalon Thessalonians who are in this pagan culture. They're surrounded by it. If you ever watch any uh, uh, archaeology of Roman sites, it is shocking how many, how many uh, uh, honestly, pornographic images are depicted in, their, in their, uh, um, their floors. They have these little mosaic floors and things and, and different artwork. It is shocking how perverse their culture is. And we kind of know it. But when you see a documentary and you, as, they're, as they're uncovering this ancient mosaic floor that is incredibly ornate and beautiful, and you realize what that picture is, like, oh, well, these people were perverse. And Paul says you need to completely separate from it. Now imagine how difficult it was to maintain complete separation in a completely perverse and pagan culture. Now, you might have to work a little hard, but not so much in our culture anymore because we're getting there. We're not quite there yet. We're not what Rome was yet, but we're running headlong that direction. We face much of the same today. Sexual sin surrounds us. It's promoted. It's celebrated. 
We're at the point on the cultural level, I wouldn't say a majority of people, but the cultural, the voices within our culture, they will criticize you if you don't celebrate wickedness and perversity. It seems the lost world doesn't really change, right? Have you ever heard anybody dismiss the Bible because it's a Stone Age or Bronze Age book written by semi-literate sheep herders? I've heard somebody call the Bible that. Like, huh, why would that have anything to do with our life today? And then you start reading and realize, oh, well, the world really hasn't changed. The world, the world hasn't changed at all. It, everything the scripture says applies to our world today. Because sin is sin. He says you need to abstain completely. That takes effort. That takes work. That takes control of your eyes. It takes control of your hands. He says you need to know how to control your body. You need to possess some self-control. It's vital. That doesn't come natural. Self-control does not come natural. You have to work at it. Romans 13, 14, Paul says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, like, like, a, like a uniform, like an outfit. Put on Christ, wear him, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Get your focus on Christ. Be careful of your decisions. This idea of making provision for the flesh. We know we're going to have, have sinful temptations. We're going to have sexual sinful temptations. Guard against that. Be careful what you bring into your home. Be careful what TV shows you have in your show. Be careful what channels you have. We will get, uh, we'll, we'll get ads for HBO sometimes. They're like, hey, $3 a month. And we're like, no, thank you. Because there's probably a few, good, few shows that would be interesting to watch, but I know what's on that channel. I'm not going to bring that into my home. Be careful what you look at. Be careful the decisions you make. He says, know how to control your body in holiness and honor. And it's important as, as believers, we understand that sex and intimacy are holy. They're honorable when practiced within God's specified order. God created marriage. He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. He, uh, you, you read in the, 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 in the New Testament, there, there's a beauty to the intimacy of a marriage relationship. It's, it's holy, it's honorable, but only when it's practiced within the created order. And that's, again, we talk about biblical marriage. We don't talk about traditional marriage. Traditional marriages are filled with abuse. They end in divorce. They're, they're untrustworthy. I mean, if you, if you just do some research on, on marriage statistics, and even marriage statistics within professing Christians, it's It's horrific. Half of Christians get divorced. Half, um, what is it? The, the first, half of first marriages end in divorce. Second marriages, three quarters of them end in divorce. It's like once you've started the divorce cycle, it, it, it ramps up. Traditional marriage is not a good thing. It's not healthy. Biblical marriage is. He goes on. He says, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. See, passion comes natural. Lust comes natural. Passion means an uncontrollable desire in this context. Lust in this context means an out-of-control craving. Those things come naturally. You don't have to teach a person to be out of control. Those of you who've had toddlers, right? You didn't have to tell your toddler how to have a tantrum. You ever have to, like, okay, now this is what you're going to do. You're going to fall down and kick this leg. No, you're doing it wrong. You don't have to teach them how to have a tantrum. That comes natural. Being out of control is our natural state. It takes work not to live like this. When Paul talks about passion of lust, he's, he's describing a raging fire. He's talking about a fire that leads to destruction. And even though our culture hasn't been destroyed yet, it is, it's important to understand, if you study history, every single world culture that breaks down morally falls. You, there is not an exception to that law. Uh, what I, had heard, I had read someplace about the 1960s sexual revolution where 
you know, the, the free love and breakdown of marriage. And, and we're, we're about two, two and a half generations into that. You know, the, the old hippies from the 60s are like the great grandparents today. Um, if you study history, no culture survived after having a sexual revolution, and many did, no culture survived more than three generations, and they collapsed. That's, that's the way it is. That, that's what happens. There's destruction that comes with living like this. And our lost culture doesn't see it. Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about this. He, saw, he says in verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies and among themselves. Verse 26, he says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And then verse 28, he says, Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithfulness, heartless, ruthless. This is a picture of God's judgment, but not God's supernatural judgment. We see that in Scripture. There are times when God supernaturally judges. The flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, those are instances of supernatural judgment. Romans 1 talks of God's judgment, but not the supernatural, just the simple, this is the natural outgrowth of bad decisions. When you decide to do things wrong, consequences come. When you, you know, the example I always use is trying to make toast in the bathtub, right? Um, there's, the, the, the maker of the toaster is not going to come to your house and you know, shoot you if you try to make toast in the bathtub. He's not gonna, they're not going to do that. But what's going to happen? You're going to electrocute yourself. Don't do it. That's not supernatural judgment. That's just the natural consequences of your bad choices. And what we see here in Romans 1 is a group of people who refuse to acknowledge God. We're going to do our own thing. And God says, fine, see how that works out for you. And the culture ends up being murderous and deceitful and malicious and ruthless and heartless. Do we see that? I mean, I, it, it, it shocks me how anybody wants to argue against what the Bible teaches when all you have to do is open, a, open the door, open the window and look out. Turn on the news. You see God's word verified over and over. Paul continues in verse 6. He says that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this manner. And transgress means to cross a line, to sin against. And this is important. He says, no one tr transgress and wrong his brother. Wrong in this context means to defraud or to greedily take for your gain something at their expense. This is, this is vital for us to grasp because our culture treats sexual sin as a victimless crime. You can easily turn on your computer and look at images, and it's not affecting anybody except it is. What our culture talks about, you know, is what, what two consenting adults want to do. It doesn't hurt anybody. Yes, it does. Sexual sin not only damages the aggressor, the person pursuing it, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. There's damage done to the aggressor, the person pursuing sin. But it also damages everyone involved. Twisting God-designed and God-ordained intimacy breaks lives, it breaks minds, it breaks hearts. We'll see people that, uh, you know, young couple, they, they want to live together before they get married. You got to see if it'll work. Just tell you, numbers, as, as the numbers uh, uh, pan out, cohabitating, living together before marriage, is almost a death sentence for your marriage. It, it, it doesn't help. It actually damages. But, but when you take this intimacy that God created for marriage and only for marriage and you, you apply it to a dating relationship or just a casual in, encounter, there's damage done. 
emotion, uh, you know, emotional, you know, hearts are damaged, minds are damaged. You're not designed to have this kind of intimacy with multiple partners. You're not designed to, to use that intimacy in a twisted and perverse way. You're not designed for it. And there are consequences. I remember, and this, this illustration is old because uh, in the 1990s, the television show Friends, which is kind of receiving a, a kind of a, the, the, the young generation starting to watch that show again. Like, oh. I always had a problem with friends because it was, it was six 20-something young people and it was the whole, whole comedy and most of you guys are old enough, you probably remember when it was on new and maybe you watched it. Half their, their you know, comedic situations was something about dating and, and, and sexual relationships and it never came back and bit them. Nobody got suicidal. Nobody had their minds twisted because it's a fictional show. In real life, you can't live that way without damage being done. And we see a culture that's damaged and just doesn't want to admit it. Twisting God-designed and God-ordained intimacy breaks hearts and lives and minds. And then he goes on, he says, the Lord is an avenger in these things. Sin has consequences. When we choose to break God's law, there are consequences. Sexual sin is especially dangerous. As Paul talks about, you know, as, as you're doing this to your body, you're doing this to somebody else's physical body. It brings damage. Hebrews 13, 4. I think it's 13, 14. Uh, but Hebrews 13 says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. There's judgment coming. It might not be God's supernatural judgment. It might be. But just as often, it's the natural results of bad choices, broken relationships, physical diseases. I mean, how many diseases do we have to deal with in our culture that are primarily because somebody has, has twisted and abused God's design for sex. Emotional distress. These things all happen. These are all judgments from God. I want to, just as a quick example, and, and um, you might not have noticed this before. I did not notice. When I was doing my study for this, I, I came across this. And uh, so in 2 Samuel chapter 11, <laughs> We, are, we, we get the story of David and Bathsheba. So David's the king. He's supposed to be off on war, but he stays home. He's out one night. He looks at this young woman who's bathing on her, on her roof, and seems like she's fine. She's doing what, you know, she's at home. He's where he shouldn't be. He brings her over. He, he takes her. She becomes pregnant. Um, I would tell you what he did was rape. It was a, it, 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 he, he didn't, this wasn't uh, uh, adultery. This was him using his power to take what he wanted. This was wrong. Now, David has a, or, or actually Bathsheba, has a grandfather named Ahithophel. Okay? This is important because uh, Bathsheba's husband was Uriah. He was one of David's mighty men. Her father was Eliam. He was one of David's mighty men. David has no business but uh, you know, messing with this, with this woman. But her grandfather is named Ahithophel, and he's one of David's trusted counselors, which is probably why she lives so close to his, his, his house. You know, that's why she's close. She, if she were across town, he probably wouldn't have seen her. But Ahithophel is one of David's trusted counselors. In 2 Samuel 15, we find that David's son Absalom, if you know that name, he usurps the throne, and Ahithophel is one of the co-conspirators. As as Absalom gets angry, he wants to take over for his dad. He, he actually sways the heart of the people. But Ahithophel, this trusted advisor that David's had a long relationship with, he, he defects and he conspires with Absalom. Why? Why would his long-term, you know, trusted advisor turn on him? Well, you mess with my granddaughter. You, you ruined my granddaughter. You, you, you killed my, my grandson-in-law, and you made a baby that died. I hate you, David. And I don't know if that's his actual, 
you know, his mindset, but it's fascinating. And we can go back to 2 Samuel 11, and we can recognize that David had no idea all the pain that that one sin would bring. David sees this beautiful woman, and instead of controlling himself and looking away and walking away, he gives in to this one sin, and he has no idea how many people are going to be hurt, including himself. Sexual sin damages. There's consequences to it. Pleasing God in avoiding immorality is complemented, as we look down at our last couple verses, in striving for godliness. So we, we need to avoid immorality. There's, there's damage that comes with it. So we please God by avoiding immorality, but we also please God in striving for godliness. He says, for God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. And this is the two-sided coin. Uh, God often tells us to avoid something, but he also tells us to strive for the opposite. So there's two sides of the coin. Don't don't be immoral, but strive for godliness. God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. It's important to understand that God has a purpose for his people. If you're in the faith, God has a purpose for you. Jesus didn't save you just so that you don't have to go to hell. Sometimes we talk about that. You know, why did Jesus die? So we could go to heaven. Well, that's the byproduct. God saved us so he could show his glory, so he could do his will. God saved you with a plan for you. God is not the needy Facebook guy who just says, give me a like, just push the like button, subscribe, get notifications, you know, whatever that is. Uh, That's not what God is. God saves with a purpose. So don't think that at some point, maybe you went to camp one summer and you said the magic prayer. And so now you've got your ticket to heaven and you can do, you can live in whatever sin you want. Don't tell yourself that. That is not the salvation that the scripture describes. God saved you because he has a purpose for you. He says, God called us, called. God is the initiator of salvation. The Son, Jesus Christ, made the final sacrifice for sin. The Father accepted the sacrifice. He raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit seals and indwells all who put their faith in Christ. Salvation is a call from God. It's initiated by God. God calls sinners to repentance and to salvation. But he doesn't call them to continued wickedness. We would throw our doors open. We would say, all are welcome here. Come as you are. You don't have to clean your life up to walk through the doors here. You don't have to clean yourself up to come and hear the gospel. But while we would say, come as you are, we would also say, don't leave as you were. Don't come in, hear the gospel, say an empty prayer and walking out, walk out in your sin thinking that you're fine. God cleans sinners. God changes sinners. He says we're called not to impurity. Impurity means uncleanness. The Greek word that's translated is is a catharsia. A catharsia. That's how you you pronounce it. You might have heard the word cathartic. Something, a cathartic experience. It means a cleansing or a healing experience. Maybe you talk to a counselor. Maybe you tell off your boss. And that's, you know, that's, that's, whew, that, that's relieved me, right? Um, it's a healing or a cleansing experience. Well, in Greek, you put the letter A in front of it, it means not. So this is a cathartic. We were not called to uncleanness. We were not called to this world's brokenness. God has a higher calling for you. He wants more for you than that. You were called to holiness, purity, cleanness. You were called to live rightly. If you're in the faith, you were called to live righteously. And then finally, you look, we look at verse 8. Paul says, therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. As we strive for godliness, we recognize God has a purpose, but also God's call must be taken seriously. Don't read God's word, chuckle, close it, and walk off to do your sin. 
take God's call seriously. When you read something in God's word, when, you, when God opens your eyes to it, take it seriously. What Paul says here, it's interesting because this teaching isn't mine and it's not even Paul's teaching. Paul says, this is a command from God himself and a God who gives the Holy Spirit to empower it. God is not commanding something impossible. When God calls you, his people, to righteousness, to holiness, avoid immorality, strive for godliness, he's not calling you to something that's impossible, something you can't do. Now, on your own, you can't. In my own flesh dwells no good thing, but I'm not on my own. As, as Jesus saved me, as Jesus washed away my sins, as the Holy Spirit indwelled me, now I can please God. I can live in a life, a, a life that is, that's pleasing to him. He gives the ability to live this way, live righteously in a perverse world. Our challenge as we close is will you obey his call? I'm going to ask Karen to come up and, and be ready to play that closing verse. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up and just be, be ready here at the front. I want to challenge you, just give you a chance to speak with God, to respond to God's word. Christian, you're, you're a believer. God expects you to live a life of purity and holiness. That's an expectation. He promises to give you the ability through the Holy Spirit to obey his call. Here's the challenge. Are you striving for godliness? Are you avoiding immorality in all its form? Or are you giving in? Are you actively, well, you know, I know that's not the best thing, but it's okay. I can do that. It won't hurt me. Are you avoiding immorality? Are you striving for godliness? If you can't, if you can't answer yes to that, take a moment to talk to your Savior. Come to the front if you want to speak to somebody. Pray where you're at. But make a commitment to effort in your Christian life. Make a commitment to strive for righteousness. And let me challenge you, if you're here and you're not a believer, you don't know Christ yet as your Savior, all sin brings consequences. Sometimes you'll hear in the culture that, you know, Christians think that, you know, this, whatever this sin is, you know, homosexuality, that is what's going to send you to hell. And that's not what the Bible teaches Sexual sin can bring broken lives and homes and bodies and minds, but you don't go to hell because of any one specific act. We're separated from God because of our sin nature, because we're sinners by nature. Our desire is to rebel against our creator. Let me challenge you. Would you like to talk to someone about the gospel? Would you like to put your faith in Jesus today? As the piano plays, take a moment and speak with God. challenges that are there. We thank you for the encouragement that even though you, you call us to honor you in our living, uh, live holy lives, abstain, avoid sexual immorality, we thank you, Lord, that you empower it, that you give the ability to obey your call. I pray for those who know you as Savior that we would strive for righteousness, that we would recognize, uh, make no provision for the flesh, that you know, guard our decisions in our minds. I pray that we would take your call seriously. Help us to be a people that are above reproach, a people who, who love you and seek to glorify you and share the gospel. And I pray, Lord, for those who don't know you as Savior yet. I pray that you would continue to work in their hearts and their lives, open their eyes to their need, draw them to salvation, that they could know the, the forgiveness and the hope that you offer. I pray that you would cleanse their lives and help us, Lord, to grow as a body of of men and women, boys and girls that want to glorify your name. Uh, use us to glorify you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.